We have a large audience online also, and, uh, and a large audience here at the Wilson Center. Thank you very much for being with us. I'm Tony Wayne. I had the pleasure of uh, once working in Mexico also, as Ambassador Salazar is now doing. And I uh, work at the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center as the co-chair of the board of the Mexico Institute. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Ambassador Ken Salazar. Uh, to uh, to this discussion of important things that just happened and now things that are going to happen as we move forward after the visit of President Lopez Obrador to Washington. I have to mention, though, that one of the most enjoyable moments of my time as ambassador in Mexico was spent with then-Secretary Ken Salazar as we got to wade out into the Rio Bravo, the Rio Grande, and help restock it with little fingerlings of fish. And we had those, those big boots on that go way up to your, your waist. And it was, uh, it was great fun to be out there um, and doing important things, both about the environment and about uh, jointness between the U.S. and Mexico because it was an effort to have an, a national conservation and national park area on both sides of that, of that border. Um, but also, it's, it's a great pleasure to have Ambassador Salazar here because there's nobody that has worked harder over uh, recent, and not only recent, months and months to help bring about a positive meeting between the presidents of the United States and Mexico and Ambassador Salazar. Um, being ambassador to, Mex to Mexico for the United States is a very demanding job. It's a big country, many stakeholders, many interests. You have to travel. Uh, regularly, you have to meet with all sorts of different groups, uh, many of which are fun to meet with, some of which are less fun to meet with. But uh, Ambassador Salazar has done this with energy, determination, and skill that is really, really commendable. And so I was very happy then to see uh, some really u valuable nuggets come out of this visit, nuggets for him to keep working on, him, him and his team at the embassy and the Mexican ambassador and, and their team. Uh, there were a lot of good things to work on that were brought up on these very challenging issues uh, and very important issues between the United States and Mexico that, as I always like to remind people, this relationship touches the daily lives of more Americans and more Mexicans than any other relationship that either country has in the world. So with that, welcome, Ambassador Salazar. And thank you for being with us. We look forward to hearing your insights. You step here, Tony. You want to sit down? So uh, first of all, let me thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for its invitation and its uh, storied work on uh, international matters that are so conse consequential to our nation. Let me also thank uh, Ambassador Tony Wayne. Uh, there are many ambassadors that the United States has sent to Mexico. Uh, Tony Wayne was one of the very best, and in very difficult times, he was able to do a lot. I do remember fondly, uh, Ambassador Wayne, the times when uh, we worked together on issues relating to the transboundary agreement in the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the binational efforts at Big Bend National Park, where we brought together a very large binational conservation area. And frankly, that would not have happened uh, without your intervention and support, uh, both here in the United States as well as with the Mexican government. Let me ask all of you uh, to reflect um, just on this week and to do it in a way that I'm going to try to focus your uh, thoughts and your conversation. If you look at this document, Printed by the White House on its stationery, dated July 12th, 2022. Just a few hours ago. It's not very old. Many of you I know follow the White House, follow departments, follow the Wilson Center, see what it is that's being posted, what's not. And many times you'll see things that seem to be very important. And most of them, frankly, are not. A few of them really are. And so when you look at the statement, which is a joint declaration by the two leaders of these two nations, President Joe Biden and President 
Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. It is a blueprint for the relationship between the United States and Mexico. I'm going to take a few minutes just to walk you through the highlights of what is an 11-page document. I will say this blueprint, this roadmap for the future, really should unite the United States of America and Mexico in a way forward. This roadmap should not be a dec democratic or republican roadmap, a right or left map. It is a map that really creates the blueprint for the future relationship of the United States and Mexico. So what is included in this 11-point statement that was reviewed, approved, discussed by the two presidents of our, the two countries? The first is that there's a statement of values, a statement of shared values. This is not a statement that could be done with China, other places around the world, but it was done here, here in Washington, D.C., with what arguably is the most consequential foreign relations relationship for the United States of America. And so that first paragraph talks about building a more prosperous and secure future for the people of North America. It also recognizes the fact that we're working through some very difficult and unprecedented challenges that we have never seen before. The pandemic, the war in Ukraine, China's threat around the world. And so what is it that binds us in these shared values? It says, this is an articulation by our presidents, that we uphold democracy, inclusive growth, transparency, rule of law, and human rights as our core values. Secondly, beyond values, what is the vision for these two nations? 129 million Mexicans, over 300 million Americans, about half a billion people between the United States and Mexico. So how are we going to achieve that vision? Direct you to paragraph two, which talks about a North American economic powerhouse. The North American economic powerhouse has been created over time through the transformation that occurred because of NAFTA. The building now in a very bipartisan support here in the United States of America of USMCA, which was passed under the prior administration. The significant support for that durable legal economic framework from both the United States and Mexico, as well as from the business community. It's a durable framework. It will stand the test of time. It will stand the politics of the moment, the politics of any administration. Third, inflation. The world is rocking itself today, uh, largely because of the decisions by Russia to invade Ukraine, because of the different point of view and power that China has. And so, yes, both the United States and Mexico are facing this very significant issue. And yet it is the integration of our supply chains between the United States and Mexico that allows us to soften that blow and to further integrate the economy. Arguably, as both presidents have stated, the fact that we're facing these global challenges gives us an opportunity to further integrate our economies, to further integrate our supply chains, and to address these kinds of issues, like the inflationary pressures that we are seeing now. Fourth, borders. I remember well my work with President George W. Bush, Senators Kennedy and Senator McCain, as we worked hard on trying to create a new relationship on migration and the border. This was back now 15, 16 years ago on the floor of the U.S. Senate, that we talked about the need to have a more secure border, a more modern border, and yet Throughout all this time, that has not been achieved. However, in this plan, in the fourth paragraph, it is stated that borders are more resilient and more efficient and safer and will enhance our shared commerce. 
Yesterday, we shared some of that plan with the United States Chamber of Commerce and the CEO Dialogue and the Mexican CCE and their leaders who were here yesterday. It is time that we move forward with the joint plan between the United States and Mexico to address the challenges across that 2,000 mile border, all the way from Brownsville to San Diego, from Tijuana to Matamoros, including the major crossings that bring about the great arteries of commerce in Juarez, El Paso, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, and other places throughout the border. Never before, under no president, under Republicans and Democrats, Reagan and Clinton, others, has there been a joint effort between the United States and Mexico to marry up, if you will, how we bring together these infrastructure and technological projects to create a modern border. Often in the business community, and I see Kansas City Southern Railroad here this morning, it is talked about how we still have a technology for a border that's about 100 years old. And yet technology, as you all see it, with your cell phones in your hands, with your ability to communicate the data that crosses that border, we need to do a lot better. So when President Biden says we're going to do it, he put his word behind it through the bipartisan infrastructure package with the direction that he's given to his cabinet to do our part on this side of the border and the direction that President Lopez Obrador and the $1.5 billion of investment that Mexico committed to put on the Mexican side of the border. Number five is about the high-level economic dialogue. I want to underscore that because no two neighbors can really resolve their challenges or define their future unless there's communication. For many years, the dialogues had died on security, on migration, on economics. We've resurrected those under the leadership of President Biden and his team. So we've already had a high-level economic dialogue, and now we will have another one in September, and that will be leading to the North American Leader Summit, where that will be hosted by Mexico, and where we'll be able to lift these issues up in a continuing dialogue between the United States and Mexico. Now, one can look back, and whether you supported the prior administration or you did not, the fact is that the lack of dialogue on any of these issues, economics, security, migration, resulted in a relationship that is not the kind of relationship that we need to have with our closest neighbors. Six, energy and climate change. Some people would have said nine months ago when Ambassador Wayne called me to congratulate me on going to Mexico, that we'd never get the Mexican president to ever even say the word climate or clean energy. Some things have changed. Significant progress has been made, in part because of the great leadership of an envoy by the name of John Kerry. Four times, four days, Mexico City with me, President Lopez Obrador in the South, in Mexico City, talking about the absolute opportunity that Mexico has to be part of a North American clean energy powerhouse. So what was said in this statement? Now these are not just words picked out of some book. These are words which were agreed to, signed off by two presidents. It says, facing the shared challenges of climate change, we resolve to promote a business environment that advances a greener, cleaner North America, acknowledging the importance of investing in and promoting renewable sources of energy. Some people say 10 months ago, the word climate had not been uttered in three years in Mexico. So what did President Lopez Obrador and President Biden, what did they agree to here? It says, facing the shared challenges of climate change, we resolve to promote a business environment that advances 
a greener, cleaner North America, acknowledging the importance of investing in and promoting renewable energy, renewable sources of energy. We commit to tackle methane emissions from oil and gas and other sectors. For those of you here who have worked in the world that I've seen in the United States and you've seen the flaring in the Permian in Texas or the Bakken in the North Dakota or the DJ Basin in Colorado, you know how we waste resources and how we're contributing to the pollution and the warming of the climate. Mexico does the same thing. But they now have a plan which is moving forward very quickly to address the methane emissions. They say, and they agreed to, accelerate the transition to zero emissions vehicles. To zero emissions vehicles. Those of you who have visited the Ford plant that produces the Mach E in Toluca, you know what they're talking about. Or as GM looks to transition its plant in Silao over to Silverado's that someday, very soon, will be all electric. You talk about all of automotriz, the automotive industry, whether it's light or heavy, freight liner, other companies, they recognize the importance of this particular statement. Seventh, security. You know, the 1980s, 90s, different presidents, cartels, violence, fentanyl, human trafficking, firearms trafficking. None of those issues, Ambassador Wayne, are new. Those issues have been there for a very long time. So what is different about this time? What is different about this time is that we have a framework. Just like in the economic sector, we have USMCA or TEMEC. We don't have a similar framework that's durable. Not yet. We're working on one. But that's why we started the Bicentennial Security Framework, which for the first time in the history of the United States, I surmise, we had the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland, accompanied by the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, accompanied by Secretary Mayorkas, accompanied by other leaders within the United States government to go to Mexico to meet with the President of Mexico to usher in this program. We're working kind of hard. It's not easy stuff. How does one deal with the human smuggling that is essentially one of the top profit lines for cartels, the smuggling of human beings across borders and onto the very sorrowful migrant corridor? How does one account for the deaths in San Antonio of over 50 human beings coming to look for a better life? How does one account for the 56 people, mostly from Guatemala, who died in Tuxtla Gutierrez and Chiapas? It's a human smuggling networks that have come to profit from the disorder of the migration laws and system that we have allowed to be created because there has been a lack of courage to address the issues of migration. So where are we today? Well, I'll take you to the Summit of the Americas. President Biden announced there the declaration that we have to deal with this issue through a regional framework. You can't address these unprecedented flows of migrants simply by doing the same old song and dance and the politics of division that have bedeviled this country for the last 40 years. You have to move beyond that. And so what did they say? This again, a roadmap, important. That's what we're going to be working on. It says, building on the commitments of the Summit of Americas made by 21 countries in the hemisphere, 
We are taking immediate and coordinated steps to manage the flows of migrants arriving into our countries. We have joined efforts to address the underlying economic and security drivers of migration and recognizing that development must be at the center of all migration policies. We will accelerate and expand international cooperation programs focused on the most marginalized communities. At the same time, we will maintain strong border enforcement policies while ensuring full protection of human rights. Continues labor pathways. The United States and Mexico reaffirmed our commitment to launch a whole effort on labor pathways and worker protections. Continues on the 10th paragraph. The tragic deaths of migrants at the hands of human smugglers in San Antonio further strengthens our determination to go after the multi-billion dollar criminal smuggling industry, preying on migrants, and increase our efforts to address the root causes of migration. The Departments of Justice, i.e. Attorney General Merrick Garland and his team, and Homeland Security and their forces We'll work with Mexico at all levels to make sure that we have a coordinated effort on human smuggling. So there's 10 points that define a blueprint. Andrew and Ambassador Wayne, it's a blueprint that's doable. And it concludes by saying this year, that means 2022. Our countries will celebrate 200 years of formal diplomatic relationships, relations. As neighbors, friends, and family, we are united as two nations that share one future. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can sit there. Or you can sit down. Yeah, you get you where, get two for the price of one. Wherever you're comfortable. You get a member of the Board of Governors of the Wilson Center. Thank you, Ambassador Salazar. Those were really some, some great remarks, and thank you for, for summarizing the, the declaration. I, I think the point you made about it being a blueprint and a doable uh, blueprint is is really critical. Uh, and, and, and something I think we need to keep in mind uh, as, as we all uh, parse and analyze the, the document, which I know many people will do. Uh, my name is Andrew Rudman. I'm the director of the Mexico Institute here at the Wilson Center, and it's my pleasure to moderate a Q&A session. We have uh, an online audience, which has already shared some questions, and we have an in-person audience. So um, I think... Uh, with your indulgence, Ambassador Salazar, we'll take a couple questions from the audience, we'll take a couple questions um, from online, and then give you a chance to respond to, to a group, and then if we have time, we'll, we'll do another round. So let's start, is there any, uh, yes, yeah, so say, I imagine there's somebody in the audience who'd like to ask a question, so. Thank you very much uh, for, for doing this, Ambassador, I appreciate it. My name is Jose Diaz with Reforma newspaper from Mexico. Uh, several members of the US Congress, your former uh, colleagues, have expressed concern about the erosion of democracy in Mexico. They cite things like the control of local elections by organized crime, the president's ag attacks against independent regulatory agencies, the growing militarization of civil duties in Mexico, the threats the, against the free press, the politicization of the attorney general's office, do you believe there's a process of democratic erosion in Mexico? Jose, thank you um, for your very good question. Uh, let me first say that Mexico has a history of corruption, a very deep-seated corruption that has transcended decades and administrations. There's corruption that's at the root 
of many of the problems that we're seeing all across Latin America, Central America, Mexico. At the highest levels, there's a commitment to root out corruption. Because unless you root out corruption, you're not going to be able to enshrine the democratic values that are set forth in the first paragraph of this joint declaration. You cannot have a functioning democracy or fair and free elections or respect for human rights or support for freedom of the press unless you deal with a fundament, fundamental issue of corruption. Now, are we at a point where we can say we, corruption is gone? No. It's an ongoing effort. It, it, is, it involves every one of the security issues that I spoke about. It involves the border and what crosses the border and what doesn't cross the border. It involves human smuggling and who is profiting from the trafficking of people across Mexico. So we're committed to working on these issues, but to do it in a way, in our view, from the United States, that upholds the democratic values that are inherent and enshrine what our nation stands for around the world. Now you refer, Jose, to the communications from my former colleagues in the United States Senate. I respect them. Senator Bob Menendez is a very good friend of mine. He feels strongly in his views. In my view, I defend Senator Bob Menendez because he's articulating a very legitimate concern. And for him to raise it, that is his right as a U.S. Senator. There are other members of the United States Senate, many of whom I worked with for a long time. I may have a very different point of view, for example, on some of the issues around migration. Uh, I may have different points of view on policy issues, but I respect them, even if they have a different point of view. And so I think, at the end of the day, when we talk about lifting up the democratic values, Jose, which are set forth in the first paragraph of this document, we need to share and show that respect across both borders and from the leaders of the two nations. Great. Thanks, Ambassador Salazar. Uh, let me I'll, I'll share a question that, that came in uh, from one of our online viewers, or I'll, I'll summarize the question, uh, which relates to the protection of journalists. You were just talking about, about security and, and about values, and, and I think the, the gist of the question really is if you could share thoughts on, on uh, what President Lopez Obrador is doing or what the government is doing in terms of trying to protect journalists. Uh, Mexico is now one of the most dangerous countries in the world, as you know, for journalists doing their jobs. And, and I think we've also seen a lot of, of attacks on, on the fourth estate, if you will, uh, you know, criticism of journalists for trying to report on what they, uh, what they find. So maybe you could talk about those issues a little bit. I'm happy to, Andrew. So. Let me just first say, uh, yeah, I meet with journalists in uh, Mexico, including in my residents, to hear their life uh, on the front lines, uh, reporting out on cartels and, and corruption. And I know that many of them are concerned about their safety. So we have meetings, I have meetings, uh, both with the Mexican government, with journalists, with uh, civil society on what more can be done including in the protection mechanisms that are funded by the United States of America to help provide protection for journalists. Whenever a journalist is killed, it's a stain on one of the fundamental freedoms of our country here. And it's a stain on freedom of speech around the world. It's important for people to speak out against it. You know, what I, I raised 
these issues with the Mexican government at the highest levels uh -huh. every time that something like this happens. They have their own program, which they call their Zero Impunity Program, which um, is um, announced in terms of the results uh, at the daily press conference of the president. They call it Zero Impunity, and they monitor each one of these cases where there's been a killing of a journalist and report out on the arrests. So that's something I watch regularly. My own view is we have to do more to protect journalists because no journalists reporting on the functions of a government even though you may not like what they have to say, should be put in any position where they feel fear for themselves or for their families. Now, the deaths of journalists in Mexico, not a recent phenomenon. The numbers are there. When one looks back, at the end of the day, it is at the heart of the corruption that has existed in Mexico for such a long time. Six years ago, before Lopez Obrador, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Who runs the local government? Who's in these positions of power? What's a relationship with some of the transnational criminal organizations that foment the violence on both sides of our border. What's the relationship there? What's the government's role? The corruption has been there. And so yes, journalists have a special place in our heart because as you say, the fourth estate, without them, we won't ensure a free and open democracy. So more has to be done, more will be done. We'll keep raising those issues to the Mexican government. But at the end of the day, that's why this bicentennial security framework must succeed. What the framework calls for is that these are shared challenges, whether it's guns that come from the United States of America that are killing people, including journalists in Mexico, whether it's human smugglers that are making the money that they're making because there is corruption in the government and they end up being associated with people here in the United States who are those who are bringing migrants to work here in the fields and hotels and places in America. That's all reflected in the reality of corruption and therefore the need for this bicentennial security framework to operate and to deal with issues of violence in Mexico. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the um, here in the room, and may maybe if it's okay, we'll take a couple, and then um, you could respond to those as, as you like. So I think there's one over here. Th thank you. Ambassador I'm Antonio Ortiz Mena from All Right Stonebridge uh, Group. And I wanted to ask you about the uh, North American uh, economic powerhouse and the blueprint that we have uh, right now. I do sense that there is a great potential, but at the same time, still some strong nationalist feelings and policies in each country. And I would point out, for example, to a dispute between Canada and Mexico on the one hand and the, and the U.S. on the other hand about uh, automotive rules of origin. And, you know, these things happen when you are, you know, neighbors and you trade, but I think that they also reflect a different vision. Uh, there's also the, you know, Made in America initiative by the U.S. that focuses on the U.S. instead of saying made in North America. And then just lastly, I don't want to put Chris Hans on a spot. He is the, he's the head of the Canada Institute here at the, at the Wilson Center. And the U.S. and Canada just recently resolved a dispute 
over solar panels. So I see these as you know economic or trade disputes, but also as a different view, nationalist view, as opposed to a North American view. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that, uh, Ambassador Salazar. Gracias. Okay, and then Cecily, just uh, there you go. Hi, thank you. Maureen Meyer from WOLA, the Washington Office on Latin America. I wanted to follow up a little bit on uh, the question you had, the comments you had made about corruption, um, human smuggling, and other issues. One on human smuggling and trafficking. We have heard a lot about Joint Task Force Alpha, the way that the U.S. is cooperating with Mexico and other countries on, on smuggling and trafficking. I'm wondering how much there's engagement with Mexico in particular on other crimes against migrants in Mexico, particularly kidnappings, which are mostly transnational in nature. A lot of kidnappings that happen, particularly in northern Mexico, where family members are in the United States that are being asked for ransom money. So how much are we working with Mexico to address these other very concerning crimes against migrants and asylum seekers. And how do we strengthen Mexico's capacity to investigate these crimes? You had mentioned impunity, and I think that's one of the underlying challenges Mexico faces for crimes against journalists, human rights violations, addressing corruption. And so how much are we really working with Mexico to, one, how do we strengthen their capacity to investigate these transnational crimes against migrants and other populations? And also on impunity in general, how are we continuing within the bicentennial framework to really work to strengthen Mexico's justice system and their investigative capacity. Thanks. Thank you, Maureen. Can we take both of them? Please, off? absolutely. Uh, thank you. So first, uh, Antonio, we're in a good moment on USMCA. Uh, that's not to say there aren't some really difficult issues that we're trying to work through, uh, but it is the law. It's a trinational law, uh, adopted, approved by the United States House and Senate, signed off by us and them. But it is a different kind of free trade agreement where there are procedures and substantive parts of the USMCA that are requiring some learning. Uh, for example, on the labor provisions, uh, the unions that are now being organized in places um, in Mexico, the rapid uh, resolution provisions of USMCA, those are all new. And so the conflicts that we will see will be the test as to how USMCA works. I'm very optimistic that it's going to work well. Uh, it is one of those things where you hear uh, the presidents on both sides and as set forth in this statement, a written statement, that we support USMCA. Now, are there going to be issues within USMCA on content, on a whole host of other issues? Yes, but that's what there are resolution issues. Are there going to be trade disputes within the USMCA or other authorities? Yes, but there are mechanisms for the resolution of those disputes. I would say, Antonio, on the broader issue of, uh, you, you refer to it as nationalization, uh, and there is some nationalization uh, efforts, uh, for example, uh, what is happening with CFE and with Pemex in, in Mexico. Um, but at the heart of what we have agreement on between the countries is the economic alignment and this economic union in North America. I could take you down agriculture, but I'd like to take you down the pathway of energy at least. We in the United States are committed to having uh, an, automo an automotive industry, an uh, electric vehicle agenda, which is robust. You know, President Biden and his team, and I, we see it as you know, an existential issue for our planet. We're not going to back away from our requirements on electric vehicles. But that means you're going to have to have renewable energy. Otherwise, the supply chain is not going to work. And so the commitments from Mexico on renewable energy have been that they're going to significantly enhance renewable energy. Yes, it includes hydro through the billion-dollar investment on new turbines and hydro. But it also includes solar. It includes geothermal, and it includes other forms of renewable energy. 
you know, Secretary Kerry and I, in many, many hours, uh, with President Lopez Obrador, have told him that this is part of Mexico's clean energy economic future. And it's not just on the renewable energies, because if you think of Mexico as well, uh, in terms of nature-based solutions, something that Ambassador Wayne knows a lot about because he and I worked on some of these things, you look at the Selva Maya in the southeast. Selva Maya is, as AMLO would say, el gran pulmón, the big lung, because you can sequester more carbon there than anywhere else other than the Amazon in the Western Hemisphere. And so we have a major effort underway, which we have been leading with the governors, seven of them, in the southeastern states for a very significant conservation program that is already underway to conserve the Silva Maya. So I say that, is that there's going to be, undoubtedly, conflicts. Mexico is a sovereign nation. We're a sovereign nation. We can't tell Mexico what to do. They can't tell us what to do. But there are international laws of order, including the USMCA, that puts safeguards on what they can do. Marine, um, the question you raise is one that I work on <laughs> every day because it goes beyond human smuggling. We have joined Task Force Alpha. We are trying to get more resources, both from the United States as well as from the federal, the, from Mexico, uh, to be able to do even more on human smuggling. We know what we got to do. Yeah, I was Attorney General in my state for six years, and security and violence and gang violence were something that I worked on nonstop for six years in my state. We can do the same thing here, but it's going to take more of a commitment on the part of both governments, the United States, and a big commitment on the part of Mexico. And that includes resources to be able to fund the capacities of their attorney general, their office, and others. You know, a day or two before I came to Washington on this trip, I met with the attorney general's team that works on organized crime. It was a deputy attorney general and each head of the various divisions. One of those divisions relates to kidnappings and to those who have disappeared. We at the State Department, through YNL, have significant resources that we make available to help build up these capacities. And we do it in many places at the state level and also at the federal level under the Bicentennial Security Agreement. And you can go to any of those states in Mexico, including from different parties. In Tabasco, southeast Mexico, where you have a Governor Carlos Merino who is in the Morena Party, we're working with him to establish those kinds of capacities within their state legal authority. In places like Chihuahua, where you have a governor from the PAN, we are working with her as well in a coalition that brings together the 13 major municipalities of the state of Chihuahua to address these very issues. It's not easy, it's tough stuff, uh, but we are making progress and I expect that because of the statements and the support from President Biden that we're going to be able to continue to make some progress on those issues. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to, I'm going to take uh, a couple, combine a couple questions that we got online um, and then if, if you have time, uh, Mr. Ambassador, after that we'll go, to, we'll go back to the audience. Um, we've received uh, a few questions that, that relate to the border, to border infrastructure, uh, both in terms of things that uh, local governments uh, across border could and should be doing. I know you've spent a lot of time on the border looking at those issues, uh, a question about the presidential permit 
uh, process and concerns that, that the U.S. may actually make it more, not less complicated. Um, and, and let me add just one more piece of, of the puzzle. When we talk about cross-border and border infrastructure, I think the focus tends to be on ports of entry and on roads and bridges. But maybe um, if you could talk about something that, that, that I anyway think is going to become increasingly important for our two countries, which is water and how we manage cross-border water under the border treaty and, and, and those aspects of water like the groundwater that are not covered by the treaty. So, uh, Andrew, uh, so, so great questions. You know, we have to show results uh, on our border infrastructure projects. Uh, we have to do it soon. These are not things that we ought to be waiting 10 years to have them happen because they're caught up in some kind of process. So we're moving fast as we identify projects that we can work on and we can push along. What they mess up too is a really good example, California, uh, Baja California, where we've spent a lot of time. I've been there now three times with the governors and lieutenant governors of the two states and uh, even with uh, the Mexican government and with our counterparts here. Yeah, that project probably was not going to be completed or it would have been completed where we'd have the U.S. side through a sand bag completed on the U.S. side, but nothing on the Mexican side. Because of the commitments that have been made here, commitments that we have from the Mexican government, we're actually going to be able to hopefully complete the crossing at Ote Mesa by 2024, which is going to be huge in terms of the commerce that flows between Mexico, the United States, California, Tijuana, that whole area. And we made major other investments at San Isidro and other places there. Uh, on your permitting issue, there is a presidential permit that's required uh, for, some, for, for many of these projects, right? Some of them already have them. Uh, some of them are in process. And um, you know, we have a proposed presidential permit uh, for a new bridge at Laredo called Laredo 4 and 5. We can go through the process. It's, uh, there's complications there, right? And there's choices to be made. Uh, but we're not, the reality is Laredo Nuevo Laredo uh, has about 40% of the commerce that comes from the Mexico, United States, United States to Mexico. So we're working very hard to try to come up with uh, some kind, well, we're working very hard. But let me uh, uh, go to your water issue, but also describe something that I see as important on the border. So Ambassador Wayne and I, and I'm so happy he's with us this morning because um, people thought we were crazy when we were talking about a uh, binational conservation area and a binational park uh, at Big Bend. I was Secretary of Interior, so I had something to say about that at the time with uh, President Obama. But I had the support of this ambassador, Tony Wayne, with uh, the government of Mexico. I don't know how many times. We went to Big Bend together, how many times we met in Mexico City. But at the end of the day, against all odds, we made it happen. So today in Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, and I see uh, my good friend Pat from uh, Kansas City Southern, who's working and helping lead some of this. We've designed a 10-kilometer, uh, 6.2-mile park on both sides of the border. When I went there some six months ago, I looked at the river on the U.S. side, and there was some green belt work that was going on. On the Mexican side, there was nothing. I was with the border patrol on the river, and they showed me where women, kids were being dumped into the river by the coyotes, overgrown invasive species on the Mexican side. And I said, why? He said, well, former President Peña Nieto had said he was going to do something about it, and nothing happened. So we through the great help of Mission Mexico and the Consul General that we have in uh, Nuevo Laredo, pulled together a task force. The mayors of Nuevo Laredo, Laredo, brought in the mayor, San Antonio, Ron Nirenberg. And today, there is a plan. And there are now resources to move forward with the creation. Some people call it a binational security park. Some people call it a binational park. But it's basically 10 kilometers, 6.2 miles, where you're going to have development, uh, you're going to have greater security, and you're going to have an example of what we can do. We can do that up and down the border. We can do it in Brownsville, Matamoros. We have a project in El Paso, in Chamizal, Juarez, where we're going to do the same thing. So 
what I'd like to do is, is to think about the border as a border that has to be secure. Because that's, if it's not secure, that's where you have the crossing of all forms of illegality. You need to do that. But we also need to lift up the border in a way that recognizes where that border community is going to grow. Where, where, is, where is the border, the U.S.-Mexico border? What's it going to look like in 2050? And if we do it right, we can make it one of the best borders and border communities in, in the world. If we don't do it right, it's not gonna be that great. So anyway, a, a lot of work on the water issues. You know, more than ever, you see the great droughts on the Colorado River and the Rio Grande. I remember working again with Ambassador Wayne on minute 319 on the Colorado River, trying to come up with water sharing agreements that helped out the Colorado River Delta. And they worked. And one of the legacies of that effort, Ambassador Wayne, uh, is that at least there's a process. I mean, we are in this huge drought situation like we have never seen at any recent time in our history. But we have a process to try to resolve these issues without resorting to, to greater conflict. But it is a dire. The water issues on both the Rio Grande and the Colorado River are dire. Uh, the water quality issues in specific areas like uh, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo is one, where we finally have a water treatment plant that was on hold for five years. And because of Consul Gener General Deanna Kim and Nadbank, Tony, that's moving forward now. So we're gonna have a water treatment plant in Nuevo Laredo that's gonna take care of one of the worst places of pollution on the Rio Grande. So, yeah, lots of issues, but lots of hope. Right. Uh, you let me uh, have a point of personal privilege, Andrew. Of course. Let me have uh, Ambassador Wayne uh, comment on the border because he knows this world. Uh, he knows where. Uh, do you mind, Tony? Well, no, thank you very much. I'd be happy to. I, I think that um, as you are indicating, we really do have to try to look at the border as a place of opportunity. We know the challenges are there, and we do need to improve the challenges. But at the same time, if we have a vision that we're looking for opportunities where, as we've said many times, we have shared responsibilities, um, there's a tremendous amount that can be done. And there are a lot of really dedicated people on both sides of that border in all these communities, in the private sector and in the public sector and academic sector also, who want to work on this. Um, the challenges we sometimes run into are policy differences within our within each government, which often then help complicate make it more complicated between the two. But we have to work hard on on bringing that together, and we have to find ways to get all these very important stakeholders along that border involved, as you've been trying very hard to do, and bring that. And I think if we can do that, as you said, there is a border of the future ready to emerge and you're going to have a lot of people working very hard to make that possible. I was very heartened to see the commitments on border infrastructure that were in, that are in this statement. I think uh, if we can take that, that forward, we now have some resources. The United States has put in a, a lot there, uh, but the 1.5 billion from Mexico was was a really nice surprise for me. You probably knew about it that coming up, and so now on that we just have to to implement implement well and not let it drag on for a long time, as as you know very well. Uh, and and one other thing I want to mention that affects the border is the commitment to set up an operational task force on fentanyl. That is so important. This is an idea that. Uh, many of us who care about America and Mexico have been pushing for a long time to really have operational engagement, and that means trusting relationships and secure relationships to go after these smugglers of death. I mean, they're basically merchants of death. And um, that, that, I think, is that just jumped out to me from this. So there's a lot good in here. The border is key to so many things that we work on together, 
And uh, thank you for all you're doing. Thank your team for all they're doing. And thanks to your Mexican colleagues who are committed to investing in this. Um, and we've mentioned uh, our friends from Kansas City Southern and Pat here. I mean, the business community, of course, is going to uh, be key stakeholders and, and key beneficiaries from a border that's modern, where flows happen on a very rapid basis, and we use all the best technology to separate that legitimate and that illegitimate traffic from each other. So thanks for all, for all you're doing, and thanks for inviting me to share some thoughts. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you to both ambassadors. And Ambassador Salazar, how are you doing on, on time? We know you've got a busy schedule. So if we can do maybe, can you do one more question? Sure. I'm on my way to, to the Capitol, and uh, sometimes I'd rather be here at the Wilson Center. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are welcome to stay as long as you like. <laughs> um, there are, there are no, no end to the number of issues I know we could talk about, but I, I think I said that Dolia Estevez had a question, so let's go there. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you very much, Ambassador, for doing this. I actually have a very quick question, and it has to do with uh, how would you describe your relationship with President uh, Lopez Obrador? Uh, would you agree with the New York Times front page article that you have a very cozy, regular, intense uh, relationship with the President? And if that's the case, uh, can you Tell us if how productive this closeness or closeness has been for a bilateral relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Uh, so let me um, frame it for you because it's a very important question. When I was asked by President Biden to be the United States Ambassador to Mexico, everyone including the most recent ambassadors there, said that there was no way that we could have a dialogue with uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, that he did not want to deal with the United States. For whatever had happened in the past, my job was to try to understand him and where he was going with Mexico and try to advance the interests of the United States. Ten months later, I would say this document should speak for itself on how we've been able to advance the interests of the United States and Mexico. I went through, I could go through each one of them again, but I won't, but I just note to you the energy and climate, renewable energy climate commitments that have been made by the Mexican president and his people. So that's advancing the United States interests and protecting the American people and American businesses. That has happened in part because I have established a good relationship with AMLO. That's why I can have Kansas City Southern or Sempra or Invenergy or companies that have major issues, at least have an audience, and I can be their ambassador as their advocate. Yesterday, at the CEO dialogue between the U.S. Chamber, which Pat Ottesmeyer led for the U.S. Chamber and the counterparts in Mexico, you had the president of Mexico sitting there for two or three hours listening to the business community of the United States and of Mexico. It included hearing from them their opportunities and their promises, but also their concerns on issues like the rule of law, regulatory certainty. Ten months ago, that dialogue would never have happened. Now, do I agree? with uh, the president on a whole number of things where we have disagreements, we, we have disagreements. I said I very much disagree with how he characterizes members of the United States Senate, like Senator Bob Menendez, 
I've worked with Senator Bob Menendez for more than 20 years. You may disagree with him on a particular policy position, but he's a proud and patriotic American and a proud United States Senator. So when those criticisms are made, I disagree with them, and I tell the President so. And there are other, many other, many other issues where I can tell the President he's wrong, and I have, and I will do that. Next question. Sure, uh, I think I had one from, over there from Leela. And, and then maybe if we can we'll go, uh, um, go to Pat, and maybe we can combine those two, and then um, we'll, we'll let you go to the Hill even if you don't want to. <laughs> Good morning, Ambassador Salazar Lila, Bad Deputy Director of the Mexico Institute here at the Wilson Center. I wanted to, to ask you um, if AMLO's five points that he proposed at the Oval Office were widely accepted by the White House. Um, I know that this is a, a blueprint for the U.S.-Mexico relationship, but does it include anything that AMLO proposed to President Biden, or was that not something that was supposed to be reflected in this joint statement? Okay. Thanks, Lila. And this will go, we'll go to Pat. I, I don't have a question. I have a, a comment uh, just to um, uh, pick up on some of the, the comments that, uh, that you made just a minute ago, Ambassador, and that is uh, – not only did we have President López Obrador engaged with the U.S.-Mexico CEO dialogue, uh, we had five members of his cabinet there almost uh, all day. And uh, I've been involved with the Mexico Institute. I've been involved with the CEO dialogue for several years. I've been the U.S. co-chair for the last uh, three years, I think. And uh, there was richer and more um, uh, encouraging engagement in the room yesterday morning than there has been for the last three or four years. And I realize COVID has, uh, has had an impact on that. But I would like to uh, just uh, point out and, and thank and commend you, Mr. Ambassador, for your outreach. I've been to your residence now, I think, three times in the last 10 months. The, the way you have engaged with the business community and been a uh, for lack of a better word that's coming to mind right now, an ambassador to the Mexican uh, leadership, government leadership and cabinet, and brought the business interest of the, of the two countries together, uh, leading to that moment uh, in White House yesterday, that statement, and that engagement with the private sector is better than it has been for many, many years. Uh, and I think uh, you know how I feel about the importance of private sector and government sector engagement on some of these issues. You heard my comments yesterday. That document is a framework, is a blueprint, to use your words, for aligning the priorities of the private sector and the government sector. And, uh, and I hope, uh, and I, I know you will continue to push for us to be closer, to be invited to the table when the HLED meets again, and, uh, and then through uh, uh, Wilson Center, through the CEO dialogue, to make sure that that private sector and government sector engagement is, is as, as rich as it can be. I also look forward to uh, inviting uh, uh, you and many others to a, a groundbreaking ceremony we're hopefully going to have in the fall to, uh, to begin the construction of our second bridge over the Rio Grande at Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, which is one of those infrastructure projects that uh, is, I think, going to be so important. So thank you. Thank you, Pat. Great. Okay. So let me, um, is it Lila or Lila? Either way, Lila. Lila. <laughs> Lila. So let, let's be clear on what happens in these White House uh, l meetings of, uh, of leaders. This is the agreed upon blueprint. This was signed off by the presidents of both nations. How in the statement that was made in the White House, uh, there are pieces in there that are included in here, uh, for example, on food security. 
where there's been significant progress and collaboration largely, and I would say this to the credit of Secretary Vilsack, who is an incredible Secretary of Agriculture, and his counterpart in Mexico, Secretary Villalobos. There are other parts of it which are not in our purview, uh, but if one wants to refer, and I would say to everybody, uh, to what happened, what's the outcome? Uh, I've been here in Mexico, I think I got here Sunday. Uh, been at the White House many hours. I've been at the State Department, been with the business community many hours. What's the outcome of the week? This is what was agreed to between the United States and Mexico by the two presidents of the two sovereign countries. And this is what I would, re I would refer people to. To Pat's uh, comment and uh, support, thank you. Uh, you know, some people ask me uh, how I feel about this relationship at this point in time. Uh, I'm, I'm determined and optimistic because there's only one way to go. It's like a family. We're neighbors. 130 million that side, 300 plus million this side. We got to figure it out. And we have not done a very good job, frankly, in the past. Not in the 90s. Not in the last decade. Not in the prior administration. So this blueprint, in my view, really is a historic one. I was reflecting some with people here in Washington, including uh, with uh, the people from the United States Department of Interior and the National Park Service who joined me at the FDR and, and uh, MLK memorials. In 1943, uh, President Roosevelt visited Monterrey. And there, he took forward what had been agreed to between President Roosevelt and the Mexico, Mexico's president to create an alliance to last. It was because we were in a war for defending freedom and liberty across the world. It was a fight for humanity for the future of this world. And there was no separation between the United States and Mexico. It's interesting that no president of the United States had visited the capital of Mexico until President Truman visited on March 3rd, 1947. It's almost 100 years after the end of the Mexican-American War. Mexican-American War, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, signed in 1848. It took 99 years for a president of the United States to visit Mexico City. Why did it happen in 1947? It happened because of FDR and the leadership that he had that created this alliance of Mexico which was supposed to be forever. Many years have passed since 1947, and we find ourselves at a time in the U.S.-Mexico relationship where all you gotta do is look back at uh, the last administration, and you gotta ask yourselves, are we way back there 100 years ago, or are we essentially building off the legacy of, of FDR. And I would say, as I watched um, AMLO visit the uh, FDR memorial, and he talked about the Sembrando Vida and the Civilian Conservation Corps of FDR, and he talked about the relationship of neighbors. I'm optimistic. It's hard. The politics are extremely hard. And that's both in Mexico and here in the United States. But uh, 
having said that, and I think uh, teeing off Pat just to conclude here, I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm determined that we can create a new reality in the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico, and that this document is a blueprint for us to get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Salazar. We so appreciate you, you coming this morning, and, and please come back again.